Okay, you already noticed in uh, the previous two uh, videos that we talked a lot about representations again. And in order to properly formalize and understand what's happening in the steerable group convolution setting, we need to know a little bit more about representations and introduce the idea of irreducible representations and the corresponding Fourier transform on, on groups, which has been mentioned uh, various times uh, already, and I hope it becomes more intuitive uh, in this video. Now, central to this idea of irreducible representations, which I'm going to introduce uh, next, is this notion of equi equivalence between group representation. And it's, it's formally, it's, it is as follows. So suppose I have two representations, which both act on, uh, on, on some vector space. And these two representations are said to be equivalent if they relate simply via a similarity transform. So that means that a uh, representation row B, which transforms some uh, vector, um, can be described in terms of row A simply by placing this vector in a different basis, where Q encodes for this change of basis, apply the representation of A in this space relative to that basis, and then trans transform it back by this uh, change of basis to the space on which row B acts. So this is called a similarity transform. And any two representations that are connected by such a uh, similarity transform are called uh, equivalent. And it looks a bit like this. Uh, suppose I have a vector and you know the, the logical thing to do is represent this vector in the usual uh, basis that we have, right? So the, 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 the one zero vector, so the horizontal axis and the zero one vector, and then describe this vector as a linear combination of a little bit of this horizontal vector, W1, and a little bit of this vertical vector, um, um, with coordinate uh, w2. Okay, but in principle I'm free to choose any basis I like to represent this, this vector in, right? Or at least any orthogonal basis. For example, I can choose uh, to describe this vector as a linear combination of a larger horizontal vector, for example uh, two times my original uh, vector, uh, in the horizontal axis, and let's say half in the vertical axis. And then relative to this basis, the coefficient you see this black arrow is much smaller than this blue arrow. So, this, this, the, so the horizontal component of this black arrow is, in this example, um, square, a half of square root of 2 divided by 2. So that brings me to this point, divided by 2, because I need to compensate uh, for the scaling over here. And the same along the vertical axis. It, it appears to be much larger in this vertical uh, direction, but that's simply because I chose a very small uh, vertical uh, basis vector. Okay, so I have two vectors of coordinates that describe the same vector in R2. So I have my red WA vector, which uh, describes the coordinates relative to this E uh, A basis, and I have this vector of coordinates relative to this blue EB uh, basis. They look different, but they represent the same vector. And on this canonical vector space, let's say, I have this rotation matrix simply uh, uh, defined, right? Uh, simply like this. So if I run to rotate my black vector, which is really one to one the, the red vector. I obtain this rotation of uh, the vector, and I can translate this uh, rotation by this change of basis. So that's what's happening over here. So I first transform my vector w a to the space uh, in which uh, row a lives or row a acts. Apply the rotation there, and then do an inverse uh, coordinate uh, change to put it back into the space. Uh, WP. And then we have these orbits of the coordinate vector that looks like this. So they're no longer circular, but they're elliptical, but they still correspond to the same rotation of our original uh, vector in, in the space uh, R2. So this tells us that representations, uh, you can show that this is still a representation. Maybe that's a good exercise to check, but it, it tells us that representations do not always have this nice clean form uh, such as this. It can have these scaling factors uh, in there as well. It's still a representation and it corresponds to some easy representation uh, via a change of basis, which is illustrated well on this slide. Okay, and now that we talk, can talk about equivalent uh, representations, we can try to find a, an equivalent representation that has this easy looking uh, form. And that is essentially summarized over here. So then we start talking about reducible representation. So a representation is called reducible if I can write it in this form, where uh, basically a change of coordinates uh, 
puts it into a space in which a nice looking block diagonal uh, representation uh, acts. So the idea is that given any representation, I want to rewrite it in such a form by finding the appropriate uh, corner transformations. And if I can no longer further block diagonalize it, so if I then take a look at one of these representations and try it again, and it doesn't really change the representation, then this thing is called an irreducible representation. So this thing itself can no longer be reduced to this uh, block diagonal form. Okay, so far we already saw two examples of uh, irreducible representations. We saw that the representation, so this entire representation acting on this vector space, was decomposed in these irreducible representations. In this case, in the complex value case, the representations are really one-dimensional, so for sure they cannot, can no longer be reduced to smaller dimensional things. Uh, so that gives us these one-dimensional complex value representations. And you see that this has indeed this nice block uh, diagonal form. And this is nice actually, putting things in this irreducible representation form, uh, because then in many analyses we can only focus, this, focus on uh, the, the subspaces which are affected by this uh, whole representation, because this is one big matrix that transforms a complete vector, but by putting it into this block diagonal form, or this block diagonal form, we can focus only on these subspaces uh, separately. So this is a irreducible real representation that only affects this particular subspace in this big uh, vector. And that simplifies problems uh, quite often. So here we have complex irreducible representations along the diagonal. And in the real case, uh, we can no longer reduce these two by two matrix while still being a representation. So in the real case, for SO2 at least, the irreducible representations are two by two matrices for all frequencies, except for the zero frequencies, so for the constant, then I have a one dimensional trivial representation. Now to illustrate that this transition from a complex representation to an uh, a nice block diagonal representation via change of basis. I'm going to show a different example. And this is also something you have uh, seen before, but maybe by then, uh, back then you weren't fully aware of what, what was happening. So let's consider the following case. So let's say I have a vector that represents a continuous signal or a discrete signal on S1, right? So suppose I have a continuous signal and I discretize it. So I sample its values at certain locations and I store these values in a vector. Uh, that's uh, this particular vector, right? So we can think of it as, well, the underlying, we have a continuous signal on S1 on the ring, but they only sample it at a discrete bunch of uh, alpha n rotation angles. And that gives me these, these vectors, um, uh, Vn's uh, elements. And maybe to, to highlight the, the connection between the continuous and discrete case, um, continuous signals are really infinite dimensional vectors, right? So uh, functions are vectors, but they're just infinite dimensional. So their values are indexed with an infinite uh, amount of points on the, the, the domain. Um, when we vectorize it, we only uh, represent it with a finite number of, of elements, and therefore we have a finite dimensional vector. So this is a finite dimensional vector representation, which could represent an underlying continuous signal. Now I want to talk about regular representations. So what do, do regular representations do? So the regular representation just shift the data around, right? It just moves uh, pieces of information to other locations in space. And in this vectorized form, when I'm talking about a discrete uh, subgroup, then the regular representation is really a permutation of my vector. It's represented by a permutation matrix. So if I move everything to the right, then this point at the end enters at the first location. So the first element is given by, so I do this row vector multiplication and that gives me this last element and I'm going to put it at the first location. And as for uh, the second element in my vector, it will filter out this 0 0.21, which was the first value. So that is shifting to, to the right. So if I uh, do that for several shift values uh, n, yeah, then I keep shifting my data. So you see the regular representation, which moves things, uh, my, well, the values in my function or vector around is simply given by a permutation. Okay, and now believe it or not, also this representation, which is kind of hard to analyze, so it's uh, a matrix to the power n, can be decomposed into irreducible representation. So it can be written in this uh, block diagonal form via a change of basis. And uh, so I computed this um, 
well, actually <laughs> many people before me have computed this. And it turns out that the change of base is given by a, a matrix that looks a bit like this. It has all these complex exponential values evaluated there, and they seem to have certain corresponding uh, frequencies in them. And that is correct. These, these rows uh, in this uh, change of basis uh, matrix really com correspond to, to circular harmonics in this case, or sampled discrete circular uh, harmonics that we've seen before. So what is happening here, so if I were to apply this change of basis, I do a row vector multiplication. So this row multiplied with this vector, which is like computing the integral of these basis functions or the inner product of these basis function with the underlying signal. And that is precisely the Fourier transform. You project a signal onto this basis and that gives me a coefficient. And that particular coefficient transformed via this irreducible representation. And I do it for the next uh, row. So it's not a basis function. I take uh, this inner product, so I project it onto this basis. And the coefficient that comes out of it uh, is really uh, transforming via this regular representation. And then if I want to reconstruct the signal again, I again do this change of basis. So I apply uh, the weight to the corresponding basis function. And then I'm back to my original uh, signal. So this is really nice. It tells, and this is actually explaining the shift theorem for uh, the, sh the Fourier shift uh, property or theorem that a representation, uh, a, a translation on my discrete signal can also be described via an element wise multiplication uh, in the Fourier domain. And I, I can imagine that if you didn't have the proper linear algebra background that, or signal processing background, that this all still looks quite weird. Uh, so I highly recommend these uh, two sources, uh, maybe starting off with this uh, brilliant blog post by uh, Michael Bronstein called Deriving Convolution from First Principles. I put the, the link over here. Um, but this is really showing how to do this spectral decomposition or the, this Fourier decomposition and how it um, can be used to implement and derive convolution operators. And in this blog post, it's actually citing uh, this, this nice uh, lecture notes, uh, Discovering Transforms, a tutorial on circular matrices, circular convolution, and the discrete Fourier transform. So this really, this source is, I think, really the precise thing that you need if you want to get some intuition or actually hands-on experience in actually deriving these, uh, these eigensystems. Because that's the thing, if you want to compute an orthogonal basis, you can always do that of, of such a, a matrix. You can always do that by computing its eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are always orthogonal. And um, so that's actually this change of basis, sorry, that we saw over here, is numerically derived uh, via an eigen uh, decomposition of this representation matrix. Okay, so I highly recommend checking out uh, these sources to get a better feel on the Fourier transform, the discrete uh, Fourier term transform and this idea of change of, of basis. Um, so this, this summarizes it. So we have on the one hand side, we have finite dimensional vectors, or we can talk about infinite dimensional uh, vectors. Um, we have a regular representation, suppose this represents a, uh, a continuous signal, then we also here we have a regular representation which corresponds to some matrix, to some uh, permutation of its elements. And we already saw the regular representation of continuous signals uh, before, like just shifting uh, the domain and resample. Now we just saw before that if we have such matrix representations, then we can apply a change of uh, coordinates uh, via a matrix Q, such that this representation is actually represented via a block diagonal uh, matrix corresponding to blocks of irreducible representations. And this Q uh, well, applies this change of basis and could be thought of as a Fourier transform that puts uh, my signal into this uh, well, um, basis that is transformed via these uh, block diagonal uh, representations. And the continuous equivalent is this. So really we have a discrete Fourier transform represented by Q and we have a continuous Fourier transform. Um, wait, maybe that's uh, best illustrated over here, which is defined as such. The continuous Fourier transform on a group is really projecting our function f onto the basis function. So really taking the inner product of f with the basis function integrate over the entire domain. And that is also happening in the discrete case, right? So we have these discrete basis functions, which are these uh, sine waves, and I 
project them onto this basis function via row vector multiplication. And that gives us the first coefficient. Row vector multiplication gives us the second uh, coefficient. And that's also happening here in the continuous case. This is this whole integral is it's like a row, that's the basis function, and the vector, that's the function itself. And this gives me the alt uh, coefficient. So then going back to, to this uh, line over here, this tells me that a representation or a shift of the signal can also be obtained by changing to a Fourier basis. So we do the Fourier transform, then apply a block diagonal matrix. And these are one dimensional representations in, in many, uh, or at least in the circular harmonic case. So that really means an element wise multiplication with complex exponentials, okay, that generates a shift of the data and then do an inverse Fourier transform to map it back to, to my original uh, signal space. And this is known as the Fourier uh, shift theorem. And through this, you can actually derive a lot of interesting uh, probabilities, so, such as the convolution um, uh, theorem, like convolution or correlation can also be applied in the Fourier domain um, or in the regular uh, domain. And that's also nicely discussed, I think, in this uh, blog post. Okay, um, yeah, so we have the decomposition into EREPs via a change of basis. We have a Fourier transform, both a discrete and a continuous uh, Fourier transform. And then of course we also have an inverse Fourier transform, which is simply summing the obtained weights with the corresponding basis functions. And you do that by all, uh, over all frequencies. So you have the sum of a cosine with a certain frequencies, the sum of a uh, cosine with the next frequencies and so on. And uh, yeah, if I have enough frequencies, then I can basically represent any signal uh, on the group uh, that I want. Right, so these rows, row L should be thought of as this harmonic basis, a basis of sines and cosines, but this row represents the uh, sines and cosines on any compact groups uh, that we consider actually in, in, in this uh, talk. And these groups, uh, these group representations, they, we, when we talked about the circular harmonics, they were just one dimensional complex valued representations, but in general, they are matrix valued. And that actually requires a slightly more general definition of the Fourier transform as follows. And I think it's, it's good if you're interested in this to, to check out um, this definition and the appendix of this paper by uh, uh, Risi Condor and Shubendu Trivedi on the generalization of equivalence and convolution in neural networks to the action of compact groups. So that has a quite general theory and I think it has a nice exposition of this Fourier theory in terms of of representations in their uh, supplementary uh, materials. But to be really brief, is the, if these are matrix valued uh, basis functions and these are matrix valued co coefficients, what's happening here is that uh, this row or matrix matrix multiplication does this row column multiplication and then the trace sums over diagonal. And what is effectively happening is that every possible function that appears in my matrix elements is multiplied with its corresponding coefficient and you sum all together that's happening in this inside this trace and then you have to compensate for the dimension of uh, of your representation so the precise thing that happens isn't really that important yet we will see some 3d examples in in the next lecture the idea is that these irreducible representations they form a orthogonal basis uh, in which we can expand any signal uh, we want um, yeah, so I think that's all we need to know about reducible and irreducible representations uh, for now.